uh, may I uh, pass the chair to Professor uh, Fujiwara san? Thank you. Uh, let's, start, let's start our session, okay? Uh, it gives, okay? It's me very uh, great pleasure to open this session. Um, I'm Katsumi Fujiwara from Osaka University. Uh, the title of this session is uh, Perspective of New World Order. And the presentation will be 15 minutes in length. And at first, we will have four presentation. And then we will have 15 minutes uh, for question. Now, first speaker is Professor Hayashi Hiroaki uh, from Rizmeka University. The title of this presentation is uh, Social Structure and State Society Relation in Russia. Uh, can you start, Professor Hayashi? Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, I just now I shared my presentation uh, slide, but is it okay? Can you see? Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes. Okay, uh, so the uh, topic of my uh, presentation is social structure and state society relations in Russia. And uh, uh, I'm interested in uh, so comparative economic systems or uh, Russian economy. And especially I'm interested in social issues of uh, Russian uh, economy or Russian society. <clears throat> and the uh, <clears throat> uh, purpose of my presentation is to uh, characterize social structure in Russia and clarify the relation between state-led economy and life of ordinary people or state society relations I, I mentioned. <clears throat> and my motivation is uh, I would like to think about sustainability of Russia uh, from a socioeconomic aspect. So, I mean, uh, what kind of characteristics does social structure in Russia after the transition to market economy have? And uh, also, uh, I would like to know commonality and the difference of state society relations uh, between advanced countries and Russia. <clears throat> And uh, uh, incidentally, uh, I have to uh, confess that uh, so my presentation does not cover so effect of recent COVID-19 so or virus times. Uh, I hope to have another chance. Okay, so I was, uh, I'd like to show my uh, basic viewpoint: <clears throat> uh, state, business, and society relation in Russia. Uh, as you know. Uh, in 1990s, so just after the transition uh, from Soviet to Russia, uh, it was uh, usually said so uh, state capture, the word state capture. Uh, this means that so uh, business uh, so uh, people uh, could uh, exploit state uh, and uh, control <clears throat> uh, based on their uh, interest. And uh, uh, but uh, uh, in around 2000, uh, the situation completely changed. Uh, state control business, so graphic hand model, so based on strong state. And after that, so uh, recently, a give and take relationship is quite uh, usually said. Uh, this means that so uh, business uh, and state share the interest and exchange. So uh, under these circumstances, uh, not only state, but so business uh, area have to make much of society. So to keep good relationship with state. So uh, as you know, that state uh, would like to uh, keep uh, stability uh, of the country. And uh, uh, so in a sense of state, it's quite interested in the uh, society or people's life. And, but uh, at the same time, so uh, business 
area. Uh, so uh, would like to keep good relationship with state. So uh, business uh, people or business uh, field uh, also have to make uh, much of society. So I mean that so uh, society is in a sense is quite important part of uh, the uh, so uh, three actors uh, to understand the contemporary Russian uh, system. Okay, uh, next uh, I would like to show. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, based on this so framework, I would like to show positive and negative side of Putin regime. Uh, quite uh, so uh, shortly. <clears throat> Uh, positive side is, uh, for example, so increase of real income based on rapid economic growth in around 2000, and uh, political and social stability, uh, especially compared to uh, 1990s. And uh, uh, negative one, uh, it's so anti-democratic or heavy-handed political method and strong economic dependence on natural resources, etc., etc. Et <laughs> And uh, uh, under this situation, uh, it is often said that uh, quite many people also support Putin uh, presidency. Sorry, this one. Uh, this is the, the uh, survey data uh, from Lebada Center, uh, so research institute. You can easily find that so oh, quite many. So, for example, oh, approximately so seventy percent of people oh, could approve or support Putin presidency. Why such uh, so oh, high uh, support uh, could be attained? Okay, I will show oh, my understanding. Uh, based on so or social contract thesis. Uh, I would show the uh, characteristics of state society relations in Russia uh, based on social contract thesis. Uh, social contract thesis uh, was put forth in the 1980s to theorize state society relations in the post Stalinist Soviet Union. And the central claim was that the Soviet regime provided a set of policy goods and educational outcomes, uh, including full and secure employment, stable and subsidized consumer prices, uh, socialized health and educational service, and egalitarian wage and income policies. Society responded with political quiescence and conformity, accepting the Communist Party's monopolistic power uh, over politics, society, and economy, it was uh, said. <clears throat> and uh, uh, historically, is social contract uh, in Soviet times, uh, in around the 20, uh, 1920s or 30s, uh, the uh, start of uh, social contract in Soviet times, and 1950s, so uh, economic growth uh, could uh, succeed uh, of social contract. And after 1970s, so uh, dependence on oil and gas uh, means so uh, generous social policy. <clears throat> so in sum, uh, we could find a comprehensive social social contract in Soviet society. And uh, uh, after the transition to uh, from Soviet to Russia, uh, we can see so new social contract in Russia. Social contract thesis could be applicable to contemporary Putin regime in a different shape, uh, according to Kuk and Dmitriev. After a decade of welfare retrenchment during the 1990s, the Putin regime has reconstructed a narrower and more strategic market social contract, and that shapes and constraints key areas of contemporary social and labor policies. And then uh, the point is that uh, who and which social strata ac uh, actually accept social contract in Russia? 
And uh, these uh, figures are also from Levada Center. And uh, uh, we don't have, uh, because of time constraint, we, uh, I would like to show just one uh, figure. Uh, this one, uh, I think this is quite important. <clears throat> Uh, which of the following opinions concerning Russian citizens' relationship with the government would you agree with most? Uh, is a uh, question. And the uh, uh, blue one is we must force the government uh, to serve our interest. And the uh, violet one is our government is currently in a position where we must help it, even if it requires some sacrifices. And green one, green one is the government gives us so little that we aren't obliged to do anything for it. And uh, finally, red one is the government gives us a lot, but citizens could ask for more. And uh, uh, I omit this one. And uh, uh, the left edge uh, data is uh, in 1989, so uh, end of Soviet. Uh, period. And at that time, uh, the violet color uh, is the most uh, top one. Uh, this is our government is currently in a position where we must help it, even if it requires some sacrifices. Uh, maybe uh, I think uh, this situation uh, could reflect so Soviet style uh, social contract. So in a sense, people support the uh, regime. And uh, after that, so uh, second uh, run, uh, second uh, data uh, is in 1999, so 10 years. So uh, of course, after the transition, at that time, uh, the top rank is this one. Uh, the government gives us so little that we aren't obliged to do anything for it. Uh, maybe in 1999, so uh, economic and political situation is not good in Russia. So uh, this reflects the uh, people's uh, uh, attitude or relationship with the government. But after that, so uh, in 2002, 2006, 2010, uh, etc., etc., uh, situation gradually changed. Uh, the government give us so little uh, that we aren't obliged to do anything for it is a little bit so uh, decreasing. And uh, this one, the government gives us a lot, but the citizens could ask for more is increasing. Okay, so uh, I think uh, this uh, shows the reflect the uh, new uh, market uh, social contract. Okay, uh, and this is uh, from official statistics, Rossstat, the ratio of expenditure for social social cultural arrangement in total, uh, sorry, uh, total budget expenditure in nine, uh, 20, uh, 2018 was almost 60%. And the breakdown of expenditure for social cultural arrangement is education, health, and social policy, mainly pension. Uh, and the expenditure for social policy occupies 36.2% of total expenditure, uh, quite big. And according to the table, uh, the ratio of uh, social uh, transfers in money income is around 20% as a, and has increased since around 20. 2010. This is the graphs. Social transfer is uh, gradually increasing. <clears throat> okay, and also I'm sorry that the uh, mm, uh, it's not good, but uh, uh, this is the uh, graphs of uh, income gaps. So Gini coefficient. Uh, maybe you can uh, easily understand, but uh, in at the beginning of uh, 1990s, just after the transition, uh, the Gini coefficient, so income gaps uh, greatly uh, increased. And after that, so uh, uh, gradually increasing and uh, uh, around 0.4 uh, 
or so. Uh, this means so oh, quite uh, high uh, income gaps in Russia, but at the same time, the uh, this uh, table shows the market income uh, so oh, income gaps based on market income and uh, after the tax uh, or uh, transfer, uh, the situation uh, is quite different. This is based on World Bank data. Uh, income gaps uh, based on market income is 0 0.485, it's quite big. But uh, 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 based on final income, um, it's, uh, Gini coefficient is 0 0.300. Oh, this is data, it's uh, the 2014th one. Uh, it's, uh, after the uh, redistribution or uh, transfer, uh, the uh, income gaps of Russia is uh, quite equalized. Okay, so uh, all in all, uh, social contract and support for Putin regime, uh, I will uh, show the uh, short so, uh, conclusion. Uh, these policies uh, uh, I have uh, said now have been maintained at great cost in both budget expenditures and market inefficiencies through the 2008-9 uh, recession and recent economic downturn. And leadership should concern about social stability as a major motivation. And this could be a main factor for the ordinary Russians to support Putin regime. Uh, of course, problems uh, could occur. Uh, money from oil and gas and rent dependent system is uh, a background of this system. Uh, this is, uh, uh, I, sorry, I uh, skipped this one. Okay, so finally, uh, the <clears throat> social stratification and the state society relations. Uh, I uh, roughly uh, divide uh, three groups in Russian society. Uh, first one, rich and elite, and middle class, and uh, poor people or uh, working class people. <clears throat> the rich and elite uh, try to avoid the risk of income redistribution that could be demanded by the median voter in a highly unequal but democratic society. <clears throat> And the middle class is more likely to support democratization. However, uh, there are divisions within the middle class itself, uh, as I will uh, explain later. <clears throat> and the poor and working class, uh, quite a high level of in, uh, inequality should provoke stronger demand for democratic elections by the poor, since they, uh, stand to benefit from democratic taxation. However, the attempt in the 1990s to build democracy is associated for many Russians with outrageous uh, government corruption, extreme inequality of opportunities, and the lies of the oligarchies. Those who are the most adversely affected have naturally been reluctant to demand uh, democratization, <clears throat> according to Bizigin and Filippio. So neither the rich and the rich or the poor working class could be an uh, active actor to break the status quo. So uh, the uh, final uh, possibility is uh, middle class. But the uh, uh, Russian middle class is quite unique. Uh, the size of middle class is uh, not, not big, uh, large. And uh, various occupational groups are included in the middle class, and the values and behavior is quite unique. And also recently, uh, the uh, middle class is changing, uh, it is said. Uh, Russian middle class featured more bureaucrats and fewer business people than in the 1990s and the early 2000s. So this shows that Russian middle class is heavily dependent on the government in terms of its composition. And this implied that uh, Russian middle class is not so uh, strong enough to reform the uh, status quo. This is the uh, figure. 
Okay, uh, so future prospect. Uh, can uh, Russian socioeconomic system be sustainable in the future? Uh, Gadi and X uh, is uh, sorry. Uh, so increasing rent is only source of significant growth for Russia. So oh, the oil and gas resource uh, money and rent is most important. And also White insists that so Putin's state building has been extraction and redistribution of land from oil and gas sector. The tolerance of high levels of corruption, the marginalization of political and civil uh, opposition, and the mobilizing of regime support through economic and national peace. So with such foundation, uh, for regime stability, there is little incentive to increase state capacity. But so there is no doubt that the Russian regime will at some point in the not too distant future either have to find alternative means of mobilizing sufficient support to maintain its dominance or rely increasingly on repressive measures to deal with growing social protest. Okay, uh, of course, uh, as I told you uh, at first part, uh, I'm sorry that I uh, don't cover uh, so recent situation. So uh, I hope to have another chance. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Hayashi. Thank you. Now, the next presentation is uh, will be made by Takuma Kobayashi from Matsuyama University. Uh, the title of his presentation is Government Enterprise Relationship in China. Uh, Professor Kobayashi, can you start? <laughs> Please. Okay. I, I, uh, just a moment. Okay. Uh, can you see my slide? Okay. Hi. <laughs> Thank you, Hai Sensei. Ed. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Takuma Kobayashi uh, from uh, Matsuyama University. Uh, it's very, uh, it's a great honor to be uh, given an opportunity to make a presentation today. Uh, let me start my presentation. Uh, today's topic of my presentation is government enterprise relationship in China. Uh, I am interested in uh, the influence of the uh, government, government uh, focusing on its relationship with enterprises. Uh, although uh, uh, China's uh, marketization process has uh, progressed, uh, government governmental market uh, intervention remains. Uh, to demonstrate the strength of the government's influence, I would like to uh, discuss the uh, significant share of the uh, state sector and Guojin Mintui, uh, which means uh, state uh, enterprises advance uh, the private sector's uh, retreat. Uh, then I will uh, describe uh, the relationship between the government and the private enterprises uh, from the perspective of uh, overcapacity and zombie enterprises. Uh, State-owned enterprises have a close relationship with the government. Then I would also like to consider the following questions. Is private enterprise uh, in uh, compliance with the market mechanism? So, uh, at first, uh, I will uh, introduce uh, one uh, indicator of uh, marketization and uh, uh, market uh, ah, marketization index market uh, marketization index. Uh, this table illustrates uh, the marketization index and its five sub indices. Uh, the marketization index is an um, uh, indicator uh, that accounts for the uh, contribution of market-oriented reform 
to economic growth. Uh, according to this index, uh, China has uh, accomplished significant achievements in marketization from 2008 to 2014. Uh, rapid progress uh, has been made in the uh, development of the private sector uh, market uh, Intermediate, in, intermediaries, the uh, legal environment and the development of uh, product markets. However, uh, progress has stalled uh, regarding the government market relationship over the past few years, uh, which indicates that there is still excessive unnecessary government intervention. Uh, thus, uh, we, uh, we can say that uh, although uh, marketization is uh, developing in China, uh, however, uh, the government uh, intervention is not uh, decreasing. Next, I will uh, talk about Guo Jinmintui. China's reform uh, of state-owned enterprises, SOE, uh, began after uh, 1978. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, uh, decision-making powers were uh, delegate, uh, delegated uh, from government to enterprises uh, regarding, uh, regarding production, sale, and so on. Uh, the separation of ownership from management uh, increased the incentive, incentive uh, toward the management of enterprises. Uh, in the uh, 1990s, uh, the reform of ownership began. Uh, the reorganization of S SOEs uh, into joint stock enterprises and limited enterprises was uh, promoted. As a result of the reform, uh, the number of SOEs introducing uh, the number of SOEs introducing private capital uh, that is mixed ownership uh, enterprises uh, increased and many small sized SOEs were sold to the private sector. Uh, SOE reform uh, has uh, stagnated uh, since the uh, 2008 uh, financial crisis. At that time, the index, the index of the government market relationship, uh, one of the sub, sub indices, uh, indices of the uh, marketization index uh, declined. Uh, the government was concerned that uh, several large sized SOEs uh, that had an abundance of physical and human capital were applying pressure on privately owned enterprises. Now, is Guo uh, Jinmin really occurring? Uh, first, I will show the size of the uh, share of the uh, state sector uh, within the GDP. According to this graph, uh, its share was 32% in 2014, and although it has been decreasing, at, but it remains at a significant level. Second, uh, state-owned enterprises were uh, predominant in strategic industries. Third, uh, SOEs enjoy uh, significant benefits from monopolies or oligopolies and uh, preferential uh, treatments in finance. Uh, this results in the, the expansion, uh, expansion of the wage gap with uh, non-SOEs. Uh, to summarize uh, the analysis of Guo Jin Min Tui, uh, the share of uh, state-owned sectors has been decreasing. However, it remains at a, a significant level. Uh, China, China's government uh, still has a strong influence on SOEs. Uh, originally, I would like to speak about the relationship between the government and the SOEs and the high productivity, uh, high productivity of SOEs. However, uh, this uh, time is restricted, so I Next, I will next uh, uh, introduce the issue of overcapacity in China and zombie enterprises.
Uh, the purpose of this uh, section uh, is to uh, examine the relationship between the government and uh, privately owned enterprises. Uh, overcapacity is uh, defined as the difference uh, between uh, production capacity and actual production. Thus, overcapacity is considered the uh, com converse of the uh, utilization rate. Uh, this figure shows uh, capacity rate, uh, rate, capacity utilization rates in six industries. Uh, in all these uh, industries, uh, capacity utilization rates have been decreasing from 2008 to 2014. Uh, the factors uh, leading to overcapacity are as follows. The first uh, factor uh, concerns uh, industrial policies uh, for a specific region. Uh, for example, the Go West strategy in 2000 and the high uh, availability of technology. Another uh, factor uh, correlated with uh, zombie enterprises, uh, which uh, I will uh, detail later, uh, concerns uh, local level economic uh, policies, uh, that is uh, subsidies to uh, subsidies uh, to produ produ producers. Uh, local officials aim to avoid laid off workers uh, due, to, uh, uh, due to concerns about social stability. If zombie enterprises are non-performing and need to be uh, shut down, then uh, employees lose their jobs. So given current economic uh, realities, new jobs may not be uh, readily available in those uh, same uh, locations. Here, I introduce you to two, uh, two studies on uh, overcapacity in, in the steel sector. One insists uh, that uh, large SOEs are the main source of the overcapacity, uh, while uh, the other uh, insists on small and medium SOEs. Uh, both researchers insist that SOEs are the main source of overcapacity. Now, uh, I think uh, I'm interested in, uh, I'm interested in, uh, are SOEs the main factor of overcapacity. In my opinion, uh, POEs, uh, POEs, privately owned enterprises, uh, also create excess capacity. Uh, the reasons for this are as follows. First, uh, small and med uh, medium-sized POEs uh, vigorously enter markets. And second, uh, POEs uh, misunderstand uh, that uh, there are uh, many opportunities to make a profit in the market. Uh, a new capital investment uh, decision and seek to uh, pursue uh, more, more profits uh, because SOEs do not exit the market. So zombie enterprises are indebted firms uh, that are unprofitable and depend on banks or government bailouts to uh, continue uh, their operation. And this figure shows uh, that number and ra ratio of zombie enterprises in industries, industry sectors above the designated sites uh, due to the uh, reform of state-owned enterprises, uh, the number of zombie enterprises decreased after 2009. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it increased again after 2000, uh, 2012. After uh, after 2012, and uh, these are factors of the uh, increase in the number of zombie enterprises. Uh, local governments collude uh, with uh, state-owned enterprises, as explained above, uh, and regarding local government officials' promotion. This uh, figure shows that number of number and ratio of inefe uh, inefficient uh, enterprises that cannot survive without local government support, uh, which are called zombie enterprises. Please see the blue and red line. 
uh, blue and red lines, the ratio of state-owned enterprises is uh, higher than that of private uh, and private enterprises. As you can see in the uh, central part of this uh, figure, central part of uh, the number of zombie and zombie private enterprises increased. Uh, is the influence of the government on PO is not significant. Uh, there are some cases uh, in, in which SOEs received loans from state-owned banks and increased their profits, uh, which uh, can be managed for small and medium-sized POEs. Uh, therefore, I think that the POEs may not, uh, may not be in uh, compliance with market mechanism. Uh, private uh, enterprises, uh, pri private enterprises also uh, become zombie uh, enterprises in the in the absence of uh, pro promising state-owned uh, enterprises. Uh, local governments also protect pri uh, private enterprises, as it is more difficult for small and medium enterprises to borrow funds from banks. Uh, they do so uh, through uh, mutual guarantees, uh, irregular financing routes, and close tie of capital and business with upstream and downstream enterprises. Uh, in this case, if one enterprise uh, faced di uh, difficulty and became a zombie enterprise, uh, other enterprises that cooperated with it would follow suit because uh, they would be obligated to rescue the uh, enterprise by lending funds. Uh, this is called the contagion effect. Next, uh, I will explain why China's government supports SOEs and POEs. Generally, the uh, purpose of enterprises is to generate profits for uh, shareholders and create value. However, in China, uh, expanding the size of uh, enterprises and increasing sales and total assets are critical. In China, uh, large enterprises uh, find it easier to obtain support from governments uh, due to the risk of mass protest occurring. Uh, when governments uh, do not save large enterprises, uh, exp experiencing financial, uh, financial difficulties, hence, uh, governments try to uh, prevent such uh, situations. The bankruptcy of large, large uh, enterprises with numerous employees has a significant impact on the local, uh, econ rec local economy and people's lives. Thus, enterprises uh, should not be shut down uh, if they expand their uh, sites. Uh, the issue of uh, inaccessible, inaccessible financing for private enterprises and small and micro enterprises remains. Uh, at the end of 2006, Shenzhen city uh, located, in, located near uh, Hong Kong and uh, decided to uh, certify large private enterprises with more than 10 billion yuan in annual sales as uh, privately owned leading enterprises and to urge banks to extend loans to them. Uh, this policy uh, selects winners and it's contra contrary to market mechanism. Although uh, it alleviates the, the difficulty of raising funds, uh, POEs expanded their size ahead of their uh, efficiency. Now, uh, I will uh, conclude my uh, presentation with the following. Uh, although China has made uh, significant achievements in marketization, a necessary uh, government uh, intervention is uh, still uh, excessive. The share of uh, state-owned uh, state sectors uh, remains at a significant level. Uh, thus, it can be said that China's government still has a, a strong influence on uh, SOEs. And other uh, number of zombie POEs has been increasing 
the government and the POEs have been maintaining a close relationship. Uh, further, contrary to the market mechanism, POEs aim to uh, expand, uh, expand uh, rather than become more efficient uh, due to uh, government policy. Uh, this is my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Kobayashi. Thank you. Now, uh, we should have the presentation of Professor uh, Olga Bobrova, but now she is proposing to skip her presentation uh, because she had already made uh, the same presentation on December 4th, uh, last, last week. And, uh, and so, now I want to ask uh, to make presentation uh, to Professor uh, Stephen Rosefield to make full presentation. And if we have a time, I, I would like to uh, back the third presentation, uh, Professor uh, Olga Bobrova to make, uh, to speak short essence of the presentation. Is it okay? So Who's speaking now, first? Am I speaking first or Olga? Yeah, to make a full presentation. Okay. Now, Olga, are you making it? I ready? Are you ready? So the presentation, his presentation is uh, titled, uh, so we, uh, so, um, it's a new principle for a better EU. Okay, please. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you. I'm a bit perplexed by the. Um, I'm, sorry, by, I'm sorry, but but. Uh, not not a, not a, not a problem. Uh, I want to see if I can access my own videos here and see if it see if it works. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, but uh, thank you, Professor. Olga Bovrova to <laughs> Olga, are you talking? We arrange a presentation. Okay, please. Steve. Yes, uh, can you can you hear me, Fujiwara-san? Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, I'm trying to discover how I can access my own videos uh, let's see if I can do this um, I, I don't seem to understand how to do it so uh, you want to uh, share the uh, screen Steve sharing the screen is okay but I have uh, paper I'd like to pull up but I don't see how to do it <laughs> I don't know your paper <laughs> but if you <laughs> okay. wish to make a, a sharing screen please Put a uh, uh, green button. <laughs> the green. <laughs> oh, thank you. There you go. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Okay. My thank job. You. My job today uh, is to present uh, an updated paper uh, that. Uh, mm, builds on the paper uh, previously planned for the um, Ayama conference. Yeah. And um, Bruno Delago, he's the co-author, and uh, I, I'm Stephen Mersfield, uh, have written a series of papers uh, on mm, salvaging the European Union. In, uh, and this involved the, the notion that uh, the architecture of the European Union uh, contained various flaws uh, that were causing consternation amongst various members. Uh, the most visible sign of this, of course, is Brexit, uh, where the uh, British uh, people decided that uh, they were sufficiently discontent with the operations 
of the European Union that uh, it would be better to separate and leave the uh, European Union and operate as an independent entity. So the problematic that Bruno and, and I adopted was to uh, try and understand uh, what might be the institutional issues that were mm, uh, causing discord within the European uh, Union. Notice I use the term institutional uh, uh, rather than uh, practical problems. Uh, in the real world, uh, there's, there's seldom a complete amity and accord amongst, amongst uh, uh, individuals. There are always inch issues that are subject to conflict and, and con controversy. Uh, Bruno and I are not interested specifically in enumerating all what those issues might be. Uh, we were taking the larger uh, perspective, regardless of the particular issues where there are institutional um, mm, defects that aggravated a co uh, conflicts that uh, were freestanding uh, on their on their own. Well, um, you can easily understand this is a practical issue because of, of Brexit, but uh, I want to mm, provide very quickly a little bit of, of history so that you can uh, under, uh, grasp the nature of the institutional problem. The, think of the European Union as a project under construction. Uh, the European Union was uh, created in a more or less ad hoc manner uh, after the Second World War uh, with a, a desire to mm, increase area-wide integration in order to decur, deter uh, the recurrence of another European war. Uh, that, was the main, that was the main goal. It was a product uh, under construction because the various countries of, of Europe uh, were unable to agree on a plan that is on an ideal um, governance structure uh, that was amenable to all, uh, to all potential participants. And so um, the compromise was to uh, take a step forward um, and then step by step try to create an order uh, that was satisfactory to all uh, participants. The mm, headline here is a word called transnationality or supranationality. The working approach was that all of the nations of, of Europe would retain their national governments for many different purposes, but they would create a, uh, an umbrella layer above the national governments that would be responsible for handling assigned tasks. So transnationality means they, there's a, uh, a sense in which there is a single government uh, existing uh, in the European uh, space uh, uh, that overlays the sub, sub governments. And what of course was always at issue was the relationship, the power relationship between the transnational strata uh, of the uh, uh, of the uh, accord and the um, underlying national national structure. Uh, you can see that, let me 
point out to you or reemphasize uh, that the participants in the uh, construction of the Euro European Union did not start with an agreed upon blueprint. So they had to feel their way into creating the, uh, the union. Um, and this is highlighted by the fact that there in, is no European Union constitution. The architecture of the European Union as an eco economic and social system was created by a series of treaties. And uh, these have serve a useful purpose, but uh, they also indicate that um, an insufficient basis existed for a European space consensus that would constitute the basis for creating a single constitution. Okay, so that's a kind of the uh, of the general background, and uh, the way the mm, construction of the European Union proceeded was that uh, some groups who favored a decentralized order uh, mm, press for less Europe, a smaller role for the transnational component of the governance structure. And those who preferred uh, a more centralized system, these are called the more Europe, more Europe group, uh, they pressed in the opposite direction with an eye essentially toward creating something like a United States of, of, um, of Europe. Please remember, there was no constitution and no basic accord as to what the end game of more Europe would look like, or the end game of less Europe would, would look like. But the, mm, the mm, pragmatic necessity of debating mm, reforms for using the slogan more Europe and, 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 less, and less Europe uh, created unnecessary tensions and frictions within within the system, because uh, without any clarity of ultimate of ultimate purpose, uh, each side was uh, able to mm, become overly concerned about dangers uh, involved in making concessions to the uh, to the other side. Okay, so all of that, comrades, is, is merely a matter of background because what um, Bruno and I decided to, to do uh, was to mm, imagine the character of uh, the existing European institutional structure uh, with, from a fresh point of view. And what uh, what we did was to uh, think of the European Union as a club. Uh, a club has uh, treaties and constitution, uh, treaties and, and rules and, 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 agree and agreements. And uh, you can imagine uh, two kinds of clubs. One, a club where uh, all members have the same standing and they ag agree to abide fully by the same rules implying some deep structures uh, to the, uh, to the uh, system. It's rules, but rules for an end with structures uh, underlaying the, the rules. That's uh, one membership club. And another club is a multi-tiered club where m members have uh, different status uh, because they only want to participate in an aspect of the club and not avail themselves of the full amenities uh, that are, are offered. Uh, the club analogy here 
for our purposes uh, means 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 this. Uh, it's possible to envisage a, a European Union that contains different categories or or classes of uh, of members that have mm, some incompatible goals. There are some shared goals, and that's why you join the club and you're a member of the club. But there are also some incompatible uh, uh, goals. And the notion of a tiered club uh, is one that allows groups of, of uh, club members uh, in different tiers to pick and choose those aspects of those uh, amenities uh, offered by the club that suit them. I'm speaking abstractly, but let's be conc concrete, c comrades. Are you going to be a member of the monetary union or are you going to uh, participate in the European Union as a non-monetary union member? Uh, there is an example uh, of a two-tiered club. Um, in one tier of the club, uh, you have a single currency uh, used, and this is the, the euros. In another, you have a multiple uh, currency regime. Because of the lack of time, I won't go into this uh, in much greater detail, except to point out that all of the members of the European Union are not playing on a level playing field. Some members of the uh, European Union are much wealthier than, uh, than others. Some find themselves uh, in a strong financial position, others find themselves in uh, uh, a very, very weak financial circumstance. And uh, depending on circumstances, there might be a track, there might be a club membership uh, that is more appropriate. Than the, than the others. Uh, again, uh, I'll, I'll skip ahead uh, uh, quickly and aware of the limitations of time. Uh, Bruno and I mm, uh, developed a, a concept which is called uh, a European Union that is multi-speed, multi-track, and multi and multi-level European Union. These are the divisions of the, that can take place in the club. So, uh, working by analogy, uh, consider only those members of the European Union that are also members of the monetary, that have committed themselves to become members of the monetary union but that commitment is not to immediately join the monetary union, uh, but at some deferred point in the future to accede to the monetary union. So the, you, you can have a comprehensive uh, European Union club that allows members to join the, union, European, the European monetary union at a speed that is most uh, beneficial to them. So this is a multi-speed uh, uh, system. It may turn out that uh, because of differences in cultures, differences in economic uh, structures, uh, that mm, the ultimate institutional structure of the system is going uh, that's best for a particular club member class is different for one class than for another. So this creates a multi-track uh, multi um, economic uh, system. What well, would a multi-track system be? In a multi-track system, some members would be members of the monetary union and some members wouldn't be. So that's a, uh, those are different tracks uh, that are, that are uh, available. 
and uh, then the the concept the concept of multi level uh, implies uh, increasingly complex particular institutional structures uh, that uh, various groups prefer uh, over the others. Uh, the, our idea of creating a flexible European Union that's multi-speed, multi-track, and multi-level. Uh, the intention is to mm, avoid the conflicts generated when one group, more Europe group, tries to put pressure on the other group, less Europe, and vice versa. You relieve that institutional source of conflict by embedding flexibility into the uh, institutional structure of the European Union. And then the rest of the paper here says concerned European Union, the word concern. And this means that uh, the institutions which are uh, to be devised not only satisfy the uh, particular and narrow needs of different constituencies within the European uh, Union, but it, it does so in a way that takes into account compassion for the needs of other, other members. So the notion is not simply to devise a more complex set of pre-agreed in, in, institutions, but to build institutions that uh, establish rules that permit members to mm, work together, to discover a sense of, of, of solidarity, to empathize with one another. And as a consequence, uh, mutually support and mutually assist the other members uh, when in, in need. Now that might seem obvious to you, except uh, when one becomes immersed in the realities of the European Union uh, history, uh, one discovers that while their people are always voicing the desirability of compassion and mutual support, the rules embedded in the institutions become barriers to the implementation of those concerns. So Bruno and I are in the process, uh, we have been now for several years, uh, not only creating a, a tiered club concept, but building a tiered cl uh, club con concept uh, that endogenizes the need for compassion and uh, mutual support among, uh, among members. Uh, mm. This paper, by the way, has already been accepted for publication and it will appear next year, 2021, in uh, Acta Econo Economica, the journal of the Hungarian Academy uh, of Sciences. And you can explore the, the, the details there. What I want to do today, this is a division of labor that Bruno and I agreed upon uh, just before the conference be, uh, began. What I want to do now is connect my commentary today with Bruno's presentation uh, last, last Friday. And I'll, I'll do it this way if I have any any, any luck with th these, these things? Um, uh, okay. Let's see. I've, I've been instructed how to, how to do this. And I need to find another, ah, I'm in luck, okay. This uh, a graph was presented by Bruno uh, Delago uh, on, on Friday. You can see that the source is the European Commission. Uh, and uh, 
it deals with the uh, yes. Sorry for we cannot see. We see uh, still the paper, the title of the paper. You know, you're not seeing the graph. No, at least I don't. No, no. Let's see. Uh, okay. Let, let. Thank you, Bruno. I, I'm a bit in, inept at all, all of this. So. Do you want let, me to upload? Let me let me see what I can. I, I've got it on my screen. Okay, comrades, rather than just the uh, fuss, fuss with this, let me just describe uh, the situation to, to you. Uh, Bruno presented a, a graph showing uh, the surge in gross debt. This is gross debt to GDP ratio. It's a standard measure of the burden uh, of the debt uh, on the national economy uh, uh, that was occasioned by the emergency expenditure needs uh, brought about by the COVID-19 crisis. And what the data, what that uh, data data shows uh, is a spike. Uh, I can give you the figures exactly for the United for the United States, for the United States, uh, just in the in 2020, the national debt that's measured in in gross in gross terms um, increased from uh, 106 to 132 percent of GDP. Uh, that's a major uh, a monumental mm, mm, intensification of the debt burden uh, on the United, United States. And a similar, uh, a similar event occurred in the European Union. Because of the limitation of time, I don't want to uh, waste time on the narrative details, but get directly to the theoretical in, in implications. Uh, the theoretical imp implications uh, uh, of, uh, of this uh, is that the American economic system and the European e economic system, while managing uh, to um, bolster aggregate effective demand to maintain something like a high level of employment in the European Union and the United States, while they were able to do that uh, through various financing financing schemes, the uh, the conse the consequence consequences mm, are mm, how should I say uh, the consequences are best perceived by looking at the past. And the past means the uh, financial crisis of 2008. In 2008, there was a similar phenomenon, and the consequence of that uh, uh, of the spike in the debt and in, in the debt burden uh, was very low inflation, extraordinarily slow growth. The slow the growth in the United States is in the last decade has been the lowest it's ever been for a decade uh, in American economic history going back to uh, 1820. In the European Union, there's been virtually no growth in the decade. So there's a connection there. One can hypothesize the existence of a connection between over, over indebtedness and sustainable rates of economic, uh, economic growth. There are many other aspects to, to this. Um, I'm just introducing this idea to you so that to help you appreciate that in the coming decade, it may be possible that the European Union will be subject to a series of crises and shocks of the sort that led to Brexit as a, as a consequence of over in indebtedness associated with COVID-19. Let me emphasize this is not a theoretical necessity. I'm drawing on analogies to help you perceive 
that there may in fact be a significant uh, problem. I'll take a, only a, a minute or two, uh, a minute or, or two more to in, in interject uh, what I what I uh, suggest is a, uh, a fresh uh, insight. Normally, when over indebtedness is talked about in in the in, in this sort of con context, one is concerned about inflation. One is concerned about financial financial crises. I want to suggest to you that as a consequence of the, of the 2008 financial crisis, uh, there was a, a hidden problem, a, a ill-perceived problem, having to do with uh, redistribution of, of income and uh, income and wealth inequality uh, in America and the, and the European Union. Uh, as a, in order to manage this excess debt, uh, the government uh, adopted policies which wound up placing a severe burden on the middle class, uh, eliminating the interest on savings accounts, uh, creating serious difficulties for retirees and other segments of the population. So this is for Bruno and I mo moving forward when we write our, our next paper. Uh, we need to do some in invest investigation, not just of the uh, mm, visible macroeconomic effects like full employment and inflation and rates of GDP, but we also need to look on the redistributive effects and the social conflict that these redistributive effects have on the um, integrity, the stability of the European Union. Tevarishi, spasiba za vnimanya. I hope I didn't speak much too long. I turn the floor over to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, you're, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, because of a short of time, uh, I want uh, let's move on to uh, a discussion. But firstly, uh, Professor uh, Bobrova, do you have um, any comment? Thank you very much uh, for giving the word. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, I'm very sorry that I, I skipped my presentation because I, I've made the same uh, on Friday and also in March when I was physically uh, in, in Kyoto, I, I made the presentation. And actually, it's not my presentation was not about my research, but about the report of, of what we do in Russia uh, to promote um, contribution of uh, professional associations in, into the for me to yeah. new world. Switch off. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so my, my comments would be, uh, thank you. It was very interesting today to, to listen to all um, participants, to all speakers. And uh, I had uh, actually comment and uh, question maybe to, um, to Hiraki Hayashi Sensei. Uh, thank you very much for your attention to Russian social sphere, uh, to welfare and the social system of Russian Federation. And uh, if you hear me, yeah, okay. I, I just wanted to, to ask you to, to comment about um, uh, maybe okay, so, social. Please. Yeah. please. Yes, okay, yes, okay. yes, you hear. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned social stability. Um, the the fact which um, which is uh, which was promised promised by Putin and by, by government to Russian society in order to uh, to get the support of people and to have this uh, power uh, in, in our country for twenty years. Um, do you think that uh, really uh, Russian people now have are, are living under the conditions of social stability? And what do you mean by social stability? I just wanted to ask if possible. Thank you, uh, Professor Hayashi. Uh, please reply. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, okay, so um, for the social stability, uh, in, in my opinion, so uh, uh, 
quite many people in Russia are, in a sense, so satisfied with the uh, uh, so, uh, situation. So not only so uh, material, uh, but also so um, the uh, relation with so the uh, society and the government, or etc. etc. Uh, so, um, mm, but uh, I'm sorry that. Uh, I actually I didn't think about the what so stability means. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, because uh, mm, yeah. So uh, mm, I'm sorry, but <laughs> can I ask you that? So for Russian people, so stability is a very important term, I think. But how do you think about it? So, <laughs> I, I just um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It's, I, I understand that's a difficult question. I'm yeah. very sorry. Uh, I just wanted to to stress that now in this pandemic year, this social stability oh, is right. really under uh, under the pressure. I mean, it will not exist anymore. Actually, and it, it, it's it's already not existing. So our population is suffering really. So we'll see what we'll have next. But thank you very much for mentioning that, that it was an agreement, that it was a deal <laughs> between people and uh, yeah. the power and the authorities. Mm -hmm. And we see what, what, how this deal will, uh, will, will develop in future. So let's, let's research, research and think about uh, it. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, the last session is about uh, the state penetrated capitalism, so the strong state. But uh, in this session, three speakers uh, talked about uh, focus on the different uh, angle. Um, for example, Professor Hayashi uh, insist, emphasized that uh, state also can uh, cannot have without caring about the uh, uh, ordinary people. And Professor Kobayashi uh, says that uh, the overcapacity is not a typical, uh, is a typical case only for SOE state-owned enterprises. And Professor Rose, Rosenfield, uh, Rosefield uh, talked about the variable group. Uh, framework of EU, so European U European Union. So it is. Uh, so it was so interesting for me. Thank you very much. But uh, I'm sorry. Uh, but now we have <laughs> we have no time for discussion. So we have to cross. Uh, I want to cross this session for by thanking for all past participants and for speakers. Thank you very much. Okay, and it's time to hand to Professor Mizobata. Okay. Sorry. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Is it possible to ask a question if it was <laughs> your question? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> One small question uh, to Steve. Uh, Steve, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I go completely agree with the presentation, and uh, you explain about the uh, so the economic. Uh, point of view, but seeing from the political point of view, um, especially a Central and East Europe was very insufficient of the European Union policy. Uh, so March speed, March mm, uh, dimension or uh, heterogeneous uh, uh, progressive society is uh, a little insufficient uh, from the uh, East Central Europe. So that's why Hungary and Poland is uh, um, uh, um, uh, stressing about the ill 
illiberal democracy and now uh, very uh, collaborating with China uh, economically or politically as well. So um, how do you think uh, not only the economic um, perspective, but also political perspective now the U European Union is a little dividing, not integrating. Uh, so not only from seeing the uh, COVID-19, but also the disparity or um, heterogeneity and uh, um, Islamophobia or such a nationalism and uh, conflict with the uh, uh, immigrants or refugees. So uh, is it possible to find the uh, good future of the European Union? How to solve these problems? Thank you very much. Kumiko, that's uh, very insightful. And uh, I've been working for, it for years to integrate economic theory and political theory. And I'll send you a paper on how to do, on how to do that, on how to do that. Uh, but with regard to our, um, uh, the paper Bruno and I, I've, I've put together, uh, our stress is on creating flexible institutions. Mm -hmm. Instead of preaching to people, sermonizing that there's this right way of doing things and that right way of, 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 of doing things, uh, we want to mm, create conflict resolution institutions within the European framework. And we want to do it at a very micro level within the scope of existing treaties. Mm -hmm. it, it turns out, I've been trained by Bruno. I would not have, I'm too abstract a person, but Bruno's great on institutional details and he's beaten this into, into me. And I now am Bruno's disciple <laughs> uh, in this regard. But, mm, in this paper, you'll see how it's possible to develop micro and nano institutions that alleviate conflict. They create pathways to leave it. If people are hard headed and refuse to compromise with one another, there's just nothing you can do about it. Uh, I don't know about your son, but maybe at some point when he was very young, he was very stubborn and you couldn't reason with him and there's nothing you could do. So I, I'm speaking about my son, you know, that, that sort of thing. If people are unreasonable, you can't, can't, you can't solve the problem, but you can create conditions for uh, empathy, conditions for facilitating mutual un understanding and mm -hmm. working together in legal written form. So that will facilitate the adjudication of disputes. Bruno, do you want to say something about that? Did I get it right? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Bruno, I should... And I would add uh, uh, one thing, uh, positive and one less positive. The less positive is that uh, I think uh, all over the world, uh, countries and people uh, tend to agree when the price is paid by future generations. Mm -hmm. The case of uh, uh, debts mm -hmm. all over the world. So <laughs> we agree that the future generation will pay the price for solving our problems now, but I think it's correct. Because obviously the, the, the deal is, uh, okay, we increase the, the, the debt uh, in order to revitalize the economies. And I think that uh, things are going decently well in Europe nowadays uh, from this perspective. Um, the, uh, the problem, uh, if, uh, let, let me answer to, to Kumiko San a bit. Um, the uh, position of uh, Hungary and Poland uh, uh, is very simple. Mm -hmm. It's similar uh, to that of Margaret Thatcher in the 70s. They want money. Uh, the next budget starting uh, uh, the 1st of January foresees basically uh, uh, they are having uh, the transfers to Hungary and Poland compared to the GDP. A dramatic decrease, which is totally justified by statistics and, and data and what happened. 
they want more money. So they simply, uh, since they have a, a veto power, they decided to use that. That will, in my view, for what we understand, go against their own interest because the European Union uh, will uh, go to another um, uh, institutional uh, setup. Uh, just to stress what, uh, what uh, um, Steve said, that we need the flexible institutions and Europe is working on this. And the agreement will, uh, if uh, Hungary and Poland keep their veto power, will be to go from a European Union solution to an inter-country agreement. So the country willing to go on, the 27 minus Hungary and Poland, 25, will establish the recovery fund as an inter-government uh, uh, agreement, uh, which means two things. First, unfortunately, this will not be a truly European Union new institution. That's a drawback. The positive from the EU point of view is that the countries which oppose it, Hungary and Poland, will be left out in the cold. They will have to go to the market to finance uh, uh, the programs. And this probably will convince them to find another uh, position, so to speak. So uh, institutions are changing and become more flexible. The problem uh, is uh, um, a little bit uh, uh, more complex. Why I agree with Steve that uh, the uh, future challenge is uh, considering redistributive uh, effects. Uh, in particular for the middle class, which is fundamental for keeping uh, political and economic stability of the European Union and support to uh, the uh, integration process. Uh, the critical problem with the European Union is to put together uh, the present with the past. Uh, the past is a priority to moral hazard. The European Union came out of, the, of World War II. So basically uh, the priority was, let's do together whatever we can, provide that no one cheats the others. And that's the reason why uh, the European Union introduced convergence parameters, control over public finances, okay? A strong limit. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the uh, crisis management and the pandemic management proved that this is not only not enough, but it has a negative effect. So we jump to the opposite, as Steve stressed, uh, uh, spend, spend, spend. Convergence parameters were uh, uh, dismissed for, we suspended uh, provisionally for this year, next year, and then we don't know, but they will uh, come back. At the same time, now we are giving priority to solving the problems and trying to revitalize the economy. We know that we must keep together constraints over moral hazard and support to growth. Now here comes our, our proposal basically. We have to think about making permanently, institutionally, the European Union more flexible. Countries are different, are in different conditions, and we should not force them to follow only one way, one track, one level, and so on and so forth. So we did not solve the problem. We gained time. The problems will return once the pandemic will be over. But I think that uh, we are much stronger now. We created genuine solidarity. We proved that the European Union makes a difference. And don't tell anyone uh, what I'm saying now. Brexit is a great support to finding a solution. Brexit blocked consistently any step in this uh, direction. Now they are out, and the chances uh, for finding a, a solution are much better than, than before. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sorry, uh, Professor Haba. Uh, we have several questions 
uh, one is from Hanawa and the other is from Chris Pope. Uh, can you see the chat and QA? Mm -hmm. I, I I don't I don't know it's uh, about our session or the other. Uh, hello, it's um, Chris Mr. Pope. I was a panelist in a in <clears throat> two other uh, sessions. Mr. Hanawa. Uh, I I wrote a question and it's accessible in the chat box on Zoom. Yes. Has has somebody else I believe. Um, addressed to either Steve or Bruno. Mm -hmm. um, uh, just let me know if you can see it. If you can't, I'm quite happy to ask it myself. Right. Thank you very much. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. So Steve or Bruno, can you <laughs> answer about that question? Yeah. Oh, Bruno, you, EMU is your favorite subject. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, uh, uh, Certainly changes are absolutely necessary and they're taking place now, unfortunately on a provisional basis. So we have to find a permanent solution. The main problem of uh, the Economic and Monetary Union uh, was that uh, uh, it was a monetary union, one currency, uh, but it was not an economic uh, uh, union if we, by economic, uh, we mean uh, policies, fiscal policies union. Uh, the European uh, economies are deeply integrated. Uh, at microeconomic level, uh, they are deeply integrated. Two thirds on average of uh, the trade of each member country takes place uh, with other member countries, okay? Uh, mergers and acquisitions, uh, they are at a decent level, not as desirable and so on and so forth. But uh, uh, the real problem was that uh, uh, we had only common monetary policies. As far as fiscal policies were concerned, they were left to national governments and they were strongly constrained by convergence parameters. Now, uh, our idea uh, by Steve and myself uh, is that exactly we have to uh, introduce more flexible institutions uh, to allow for, uh, we did not speak uh, clearly in, uh, in the paper, but that is behind everything, that to allow for, a, uh, for fiscal policies to be managed uh, also at uh, uh, European level. I say also because much will remain in, uh, in the national countries, but uh, obviously not constrained by strict convergence parameters. Now, for this to be possible, we should be aware that moral hazard is not a danger anymore. Uh, one good uh, point for this point of view is that inflation, in spite of all the extreme expansionary monetary and fiscal policies that have been implemented in the last months, is negative. We are in deflation. So it's no moral hazard in this sense, it's not a danger. And that's the reason why uh, uh, European authorities uh, agreed on, and national authorities agreed on the recovery fund. But sooner or later, this will, be, this will end. The European Union must understand that it has to transform its uh, um, institutional framework to deal with crisis management. That was totally forgotten. Not only, not only in Europe, all over the world. We thought that the crisis belonged to the past. In a little bit more than 10 years, we saw two major devastating crises and we, the Europe is late in this sense. Now things work decently, but this is an ad hoc solution. Mm. We must institutionalize and we think uh, with Steve that this should be institutionalized uh, in, in, this, in our flexible construction that we have in mind in, this, in the, um, of the European Union. But uh, I agree with you. I mean, the uh, European Economic and Monetary Union must be completed. 
What is missing are fiscal policies, and I would add growth policies, not deal only with the short term, look at the long term, because the outcome of the uh, European uh, integration will come out from this, our ability to support growth. The European Union and the Eurozone, in the worse, had been among the uh, highly developed uh, uh, countries, the uh, uh, slowest in growth. Worse than Great Britain, growth in the United States, well, we compare decently well only with Japan, unfortunately. Okay, thank you very much. All of the question and answer. Thank you. Professor Midobata, thank you very much. Closing this uh, yes, please. Uh, Professor Mizobata and uh, Steve. Okay. Okay, just we, sorry, it should be uh, some questions are remain, remaining. Uh, however, it should be uh, time constraint uh, restricted. So uh, please forgive our uh, impoliteness. Okay, thank you very much for all the participants. Uh, so so I, uh, to hear three days uh, discussions. New world order is very charming and very complex concept. Mm -hmm. And even though uh, China, America yeah, becomes a key players and security problem becomes a top priority field. Uh, however, I think uh, uh, as a society, as a uh, countries, and uh, as a problem are, not, uh, are also important one. Uh, as today's uh, so as a presentation suggests, so Asian countries. Russia and the EU also become a very great import uh, to players. And uh, uh, in addition, uh, COVID-19 give us a very stimulating uh, motivation to uh, uh, rethink uh, to all the uh, researchers. Uh, we can't examine the contemporary society by a stereotyped view. And we have a chance uh, to innovate our ideas. At the same time, so in order to develop our research, is a collaboration is indispensable. Online challenge is may, maybe regarded as uh, uh, second best uh, so measures. And, and I hope the uh, uh, conference has made uh, a contribution for mutual understanding and all the participants enjoyed the conference for three days. And I would like, I would be grateful uh, if you uh, expand uh, collaboration uh, through Kiel uh, Kyoto University. And finally, um, I would be like to express my uh, deepest appreciation uh, to Professor Hawa uh, for his uh, energetic uh, three days conference organizations and the ASTEM uh, company for the well organized uh, arrangement uh, of uh, online conference. And of course, if uh, the situation so improves, so, uh, see you in, next time in Kyoto. Okay. Thank you very much for joining the conference. Thank you very much. Yeah, Steve. Yes. How was Steve? Would you, would you make a, a brief talk, a comment, mm -hmm. uh, uh, remarks? Okay. I would simply like to thank everybody for participating in, in the conference. Uh, I was at a disadvantage because uh, I was asleep uh, <laughs> here in in the United States most of the from most of the uh, sessions, so I can't really uh, make any strong statement about, <laughs> about all the different papers that were uh, that were given. I want to reiterate my astonishment at how successful this conference has has been. Uh, you can see it visibly in terms of the participation and the high quality of the of the papers that I've uh, uh, I've heard. And again, to reiterate, uh, great congratulations both to Mizubata San and uh, and and Haba Sensei because uh, th this was a formidable task. I. I can't really imagine how you were able to uh, succeed and carry it through. So 
uh, uh, I want to express my deep appreciation for all of your hard efforts. Please. Uh, let me just say one, one, one other thing, uh, sort of a philosophical thing. That, that I'm, I'm just in the throes of finishing a book. I'll be done next uh, in the next day, day or two. And uh, as difficult as the current problems uh, before us seem to be today, tomorrow looks even more difficult. Uh, the, the, I'll speak about my country. There's extreme polarization in my, my, my country at, um, at, this, at this time. And people aren't listening to one another. It's sort of a breakdown in, in civic in civic uh, society. And one uh, new development you may not be familiar with uh, in, in Asia or, 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 or in, in Europe, uh, there's a very powerful and growing voice uh, for anti-meritocracy. And uh, that means if you're productive and you're effective, you're somehow an evil person. Uh, and uh, so the, the anti-meritocracy is uh, expressed as anti-productivity. Mm -hmm. People who are productive should expect in the future to be punished for their productivity. Uh, the uh, from an economist's point of view, we, we will always reflexively counter argue that if you punish productivity, you'll uh, suppress economic growth. You'll suppress, suppress development. There needs to be a relationship between performance and, re and reward. But there is a vocal segment of the uh, academic, business, and political community in the, in the United States that's quite happy to accept no growth in order to obtain whatever they consider to be their progressive priorities. And uh, if that uh, idea takes hold, then it creates an entirely new dimension for needless social, conf social conflict. So, <laughs> If, you, if you're not living in the United States, you can't feel the, the, the uh, tidal tectonic plates shifting, the tide, the tide, the tide, tidal shift, um, gi giving you an early alert to that problem. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, U.S. is really a very serious situation. Uh, Biden was succeeded, but uh, the uh, American people divided completely too. So that's mm -hmm. why in the future also it might be very difficult. Um, a European Union as well, a uh, strong uh, nationalism and populism and uh, Japan also not to so stable under the Suga government. So that's why most of all developed country is uh, problematic. Uh, that's why we made uh, uh, this conference uh, 100 years of world wars and regional collaboration and find a good governance, how to make new world order. Uh, this three days um, conference was very much succeeded. I am grateful for your participation uh, of the conference. We'd like to express our sincere gratitude to those who presented, moderated, and participated in from all over the world under the support of Science Council of Japan, uh, Kyoto University, Aoyama Gakuin University, and CHIR Commission of History of International Relations and all 12 countries, uh, Europe, US, Asia, uh, to all over the world networking by online. The third day of the conference at Kyoto University has three sessions, a historical perspective of a world, uh, sorry, historical perspective world order and Asia, 
state permeated uh, capitalism under globalization and perspective of new world order. All of them were very well organized and well investigated. We learned very much from each presentations and discussions. Thank you very much. For three days, a totally more than 340 people participated in. It is grateful. Um, we'd like to appreciate all of the participants with sincere gratitude, the information provided by researchers, young researchers, students, citizens, companies, by the help of Asahi Shimbun, uh, combining 12 countries all over the world, uh, Europe, especially Italy, uh, France, Spain, and UK, and uh, Russia, USA, uh, and Asia, India, China, Korea, Thailand, and uh, uh, so many countries participated in. We really uh, appreciate uh, of that. All the contents of the conference can be viewed uh, on demand online on YouTube with the password until Christmas, December 24. So please apply to see uh, if you are the midnight or early morning. In the future, we will publish the uh, conference contents to the Supringa book. So we'd like to continue to work together with you about a year. Please come to Japan again when the COVID-19 has converged. We sincerely hope that we can meet in Japan, in Tokyo and Kyoto with you, 12 countries, researchers, and all over the world and more. Thank you very much to all the participants, um, Professor Mizobata, Kyoto University, CHIL, XCOM members, especially Professor Canavero and Professor Lamy, thank you very much for coming. And everyone from Russian researchers in Russia and uh, USA, uh, Steve and uh, Bruno, <laughs> everyone. So uh, 12 countries from the, all over the world. Thank you very much indeed for all. Thank you very much.